What next for the boxing world? Let's get into it. Hello, welcome to Tommy Edson. I hope you're well. If you like what I do here, don't forget to like and share the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notifications bell for all future videos. So, what next for the boxing world? Well, we've had the 5v5. The Saudi cars that just seem to be getting better and better each time. The excitement seems to be getting more and more from all quarters, apart from Carl Frotch, who still seems to be sticking the knife in, uh, of course, especially over atmosphere. From my point of view, it's we're getting the fights that we want, but the, there's a big problem here, and it's, it's kind of making us greedy for more. We want more. Well, I certainly want more. And I've just been thinking this you know, this morning, what kind of fights do I really want in the future? Now, we're already looking forward now to the September card, which they're going to have a press conference uh, at the end of this month, isn't it? And Tokyo El Sheikh is going to come over as well. And um, we're expecting AJ to fight Dubois now. But is that the fight that we really want? Many people say, yes, it is, but it isn't really. It's only because Dubois beat Hergovic that we kind of think, okay, yeah, he's he's a good fight for AJ. But really, AJ and Fury, AJ, Usyk, those are the fights that we really wanted to see. We really wanted to see, at one point, before Wilder fought Parker, we really wanted to see AJ Wilder. But obviously, Wilder's just, you know, shot his career in the foot, really. So which which fights do we really want to see? So I thought, well, these are the fights that I want to see. In the heavyweight division, this is. Right. What next for the boxing world? So this is what I want. If Saudis, if you're listening, take our shake. If you're listening, these I would want, not necessarily a five v five card or a six v six or seven v seven, which I think is great. By the way, this kind of team concept is really good. You know, we could have Queensbury against Bob Arum. We could have uh, Matchroom against Golden Boy. That would be really good. We could have UK versus uh, USA or UK versus Europe or whatever. You could have so many different combinations, right? But one fight card that I'd love to see is a champion's fight card. Every, every fight is a world title fight. Now, it doesn't matter about the, the uh, divisions, weight divisions. It could be anything. It could be, you know, lightweight, welterweight, whatever, up to heavyweight. I think you've got to end on a heavyweight. But I'd love to be able to see that all the way up. That would be fantastic. We've got some great fight cards coming through. We've got some great fights in the, in the making as well. Bivol Biterviev, that's coming in October. Obviously, we got Fury against Usyk in the rematch. Who wins that? I mean, you know, lots of people saying, you know, Usyk is just going to bash him again. I'm, I've said right from the very start that I think there's a way to fight Usyk. And Fury just didn't get his tactics right on the night. I think in the rematch, if he gets his tactics right, I think he will beat him. And we've also got to look at these fighters who are plus 35 years old. Obviously, Fury and Usyk just, you know, edging towards 40 as well. Zhang and Wilder already there. You kind of think, well, the next generation coming through, the Dubois of this world, even the really young kids, Moses of Atoma, let's say, Jared Anderson as well, that kind of thing, the next generation that are coming through, if you put them in a ring now with Usyk, with Fury, with AJ, would they have a good chance of upsetting them? Would they have a good chance of winning? Things we just don't know because rankings sometimes, that, that prevents that, doesn't it? And obviously politics before would prevent that as well. It's almost that like they haven't earned their dues to be able to get into the ring. The great thing about the Saudi cards, let's say, is that they're kind of wiping away, cleaning away all that sort of politics. So now we could we could get dream matchups, or we could get matchups between fighters that wouldn't normally get into the ring with each other. So I think it's a, it's the pro, the future is great, but I'd say from the for Saudis, whilst there's some great cards coming through. I would just love them to continue with their 5v5s or 6v6s, promoter against promoter. I think that's a great concept. I love these big fight cards which they're bringing, whether the United States or the UK or other parts of the world or whether they're going to keep them in Saudi. I, I love that, that they've got some great fights uh, on, the, on the fight cards. But I would just love it if they had a world title night, a world title card where it would just be stacked seven or eight fights and everyone is a world title fight. I would absolutely love that.
but let's just look forward a little bit we've got the uh we've got the august card and then we've got uh the uh, september card the september one for me is the one i'm really looking forward to and obviously aj i really want aj to to fight again i love watching you know this kind of resurgence or you know where he seems to have a lot more focus a lot more desire to just win I, I think it looks great. But the problem is, have we really seen him with a quality operator? Now, Dubois, in all fairness, has really risen up the rankings. But the problem is with rankings, as we all know, it's it's a it's do you really trust the rankings? Do we really know if the rankings, you know, are worth their salt? I was just looking at all the rankings this morning again. And if you look go on to the Ring magazine, they've just uh, a couple of days ago, they've just reissued their rankings as well. And even the Ring magazine, which many say that's what you should be looking at, they're all over the place, in my estimation, of where the rankings should be. I think just in the lightweight division, I think they got Lomachenko as uh, number one now. And I think they've got Javonta Davis, I could be wrong here, number two. But in the in the pound-for-pound pound rankings, Javonta Davis, I think, is number seven or number eight. Lomachenko isn't there anywhere. So in the pound for pound, you got Javante Davis in the top ten, but Lomachenko isn't there. It doesn't make you know. There, there seem and you look at the rankings all over the place. It, there seems to be lots of different issues there. But look, Dubois and AJ is it a decent fight? I think it's a great fight. Don't get me wrong, but I'm not necessarily sure it's the fight I really wanted to see. A great fight for me for Dubois would be against Cabal. I think that would be a fantastic fight. Cabial, you know, I th I think he's a fantastic fighter. I really love the way he fights. And I think that would be a fantastic matchup. I think that would be a very intriguing matchup. I'd also like to see Cabial against Joseph Parker because I think that would be a great matchup. For AJ, because we've already seen Joseph Parker and AJ before, do you know what? who I'd really like to see in there? I'd really like to see Zhile Zhang in there. Because Yuli Zhang has kind of proven himself. I think he should have beaten Joseph Parker. I think he had it tactically wrong. And I think if he just stuck with his early game plan, he would have got him out of there. Let's not forget, you know, it was a close points win, but he did knock him down twice in that uh in the, in that fight. So I think he, you know, he just he just kind of went off the gas and he, he should have won it basically. But he's just come back with a win after Wilder, an impressive, impressive knockout. But it's against Waldo, who seems to have lost his juice, right? But I think, I think, Zhile Zhang against AJ is the fight that I definitely want to watch. But if you think about the global appeal, Zhile Zhang, right? He's got a billion people in China who would just be watching that. You've probably got another billion Chinese around the world who would be watching that. That fight would make massive numbers, huge numbers, let alone the British fans, the American fans, and just general boxing fans. I think that's the fight to make. Jilly Zhang against AJ in September. I don't think the Dubois is. Now, yes, it's more than likely that Dubois and AJ is going to be the, the card. We're also expecting Inoue to be fighting on the undercard as well. I can't wait to see uh, Inoue fight again. I hope he's the, the supporting fighter for that. I, I really, I don't, I hope they just don't put him down the pecking order because he should be right at the top because he's a main eventer, right? He should be right at the top there and he should be co-main event for me next to AJ. But that's just um, my opinion. I'd, I'd love, I'd love the Saudis to make dream fights. We all want that now, dream fights. I want Canelo Benavides. They're talking Benavides uh, Bivol, but I want Canelo Benavides. That's the one I want. I want Bivol Beterviev. And I think Bevel would do that. I think he'll, he'll win that. He'll win it on points. But Beterviev is just a monster, isn't he? But I can't wait for that fight. So these kind of dream matchups, that's what we want. I want a champion's night of boxing. That's what I want. And I want more of these cards. I want it more and more. They've kind of whetted our appetite with this. And we've kind of been starved of great matchups in boxing for way too long. Now, if you're anything like me, I'm thinking, well, why can't we have more? We want more. Why can't we have more? And I've said this in a previous video that the, the Saudis, for me, what they've done, they've opened up the interest in boxing and in smaller cards, let's say domestic cards, 
there's a lot of interest there now a lot more interest a lot more popularity probably because these fights the big fights are going elsewhere so there's more of a demand to go and see uh you know fighting we've just had the press conference here in the uk right now this uh, this morning or the lunchtime uh for um uh, Fisher against uh, Babich as well, uh, and that's coming up uh, next month as well. So you know that, that's I'm really interested to see how Fisher can do. Johnny Fisher can do. You know he's stepping up, he's stepping up in class. Yeah, it's a it's a big test for Johnny Fisher, but you know he's a fighter I, I like to see. But there's a next generation of fighters coming through, and it's really who's gonna who's gonna sort of trickle to the top. Dubois seems to be number one of the next generation. Jared Anderson is there. He got a points win a couple of months ago as well. And let's not forget the August 3rd card as well. We've got Andy Ruiz, finally. Andy Ruiz coming back into uh, the uh, the mix. So, got to see what he can do. Uh, he's going up against Gerald Miller as well. I mean, I don't put Gerald Miller in that kind of, in that top 10 at all, even top 15. I don't really rate him as a fighter that much. Andy Ruiz... I think could shock a lot of people, but he just hasn't been active enough. But of the next generation coming through, well, there's some decent fighters there as well. The Nigerian, the Jagba as well. Uh, yeah, a decent win in his uh, last outing as well. So I think, yeah, he could he could make waves uh, in the future. Let I mean, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? But it'll be great just to get the heavyweights kind of leading the charge and getting these fights made and dream matchups and just say, look, you fight him, you fight him. Let's just have magical nights of boxing. I'd love to see a world title uh, fight card. I've already said that, but I'd also like to see a heavyweight fight card. I'd like to see another division. A uh, fight card, a lightweight fight card, a welterweight fight card. I know it's almost like, well, you shouldn't really do that. It's kind of going against convention. But I think if you get these huge matchups, that will be fantastic. The problem here is, is trying to get some of these fighters, let's say from the United States, to come out of the United States and go and fight in Saudi Arabia. Maybe there's some kind of block there. Maybe there's some kind of reason they don't want to go there as well. But for me, that's where if the, if the money's there and the and they're willing to pay for these uh, fights and make these matchups, then every fighter should be chomping at the bit just to try and get involved. Let's not forget in the last five v five card. Uh, who was it? Joseph Parker, uh, Jair Patai, they all flew over. They all flew over just to make themselves present, keep themselves in the consciousness of the Saudis as well. To say, look, you know, we want to fight as well. We want to keep on fighting. That's what you need to do. AJ was there. Just keep it, just keep themselves in the mix. Keep themselves in the conversation. If you're not in the conversation, you're never really going to be given that opportunity. Well, certainly in, in the Saudi card as well. Now, kind of, Turkey Al Sheikh has already kind of had a little dig in the past at Golden Boy and, and, and other sort of smaller promoters and, and boxers as well, like Javante Davis as well. You know, to say, well, look, if you don't want to come over, then you know, just don't. You know, you know, enjoy, enjoy the, uh, enjoy the party, as it were. But there are so there are so many great fights to be made. When this, when this top tier of boxers, especially in the heavyweight division, move on then we've got more coming through with this saudi with this saudi boxing going on and if they put on a lot more fight cards and if these boxers are a lot more active and i'm talking fighting three or four times a year minimum obviously barring injury of course then they can soon propel themselves up up all rankings whether on individual sanctioning body uh, rankings or let's say on ring magazine rankings as well i mean we are kind of heading towards a situation if the saudis continue with this if world boxing evolves into like sort of dream matchups or just putting fight cards that would never have happened before it's almost like what you don't need you don't need the world rankings anymore. You don't need the the uh, the bounce anymore. You just need one bounce, like a UFC star. You just need one bounce. That's it. It's world champion. And whoever wants to fight him, whoever wants to be a contender, they have to get themselves up to the contender spot. 
but the but the champion has to fight bar an injury of course you know minimum three times a year or something like that you could almost have had let's say a gold silver bronze position uh you know for boxers you know you've got the gold medalist you got the silver medalist and you got the bronze medalist you know that kind of thing it could change it could change you know in our lifetime that this this new way of dealing with boxing could also and it really depends if the Saudis force this to say look we want to stream matchups and we want to have the matchups that the the commissioning uh, bodies don't even want to have and maybe you just say to something like uh, Moses Atome and you say right okay these are really good prospect actually Let's just see how you do against uh, a Joseph Parker. Let's just see how a young kid could do. You know, he doesn't have to have another eight more fights. Let's just see how he does now. That kind of thing. Now, the problem is we always have politics before, right? We want to see the big fighters who have paid their dues, who have been in the game for, for a long time, to, you know, rise up, rise up the ranks and, and let's get those big fights. But it kind of goes back to my earlier point you kind of wonder sometimes are they just kind of protecting themselves against these fighters that are coming up especially in the heavyweight division you think do you know what it's dangerous you know if you get clipped there you could easily go down now you could say this about all the weight divisions of course you know sometimes you get the feeling that the fighters they get into the top 10 the top five especially and certainly when they're world title holders all of a sudden you think well you know, what, why don't they just fight somebody who's a, a top 10 or a top 15 or a top 20? Why don't they fight a kid out of nowhere? You know, because obviously you've got to try and sell it, right? But let's just say a, a, a relatively new fighter is devastating, right? He's just knocking him out his opponent. He's had 10 fights. He's knocked them all out. Then all of a sudden you think, right, you know, I'll, I'll take you on. And let's just see how good you are. It'd be really interesting. The problem is, I don't think, I don't think it would sell because they're not enough. It's not a big enough name, and that's the problem. Boxing and boxers have had is that they need to build up their name, build up their profile a lot more. I kind of always bring this back to what I was uh, saying in the past about influencer boxing and misfits boxing, that that kind of thing. It's not the quality of the boxing; it's the engagement that you've got to look at it's the engagement of the the boxers let's say in the, the participants you know in misfits boxing in that case the engagement they have with their audience and how invested the audience are right from the very first fight on the fight card and all the way through up to the main event that's what i think the saudis need to be you know trying to deliver in in that they're putting on great fights right at the right at the foot of the fight card great fights and if you can get that and draw the crowd in draw the pay-per-view uh, audience right from the very first fight like i am I, I i always like to watch the the uh the undercard as well if you can if you can do that then you kind of re-energize the 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 public the audience into just wanting to watch the whole the whole show as it were and the the way you do that is just just putting on bangers, putting on 50-50 fights, putting on a great uh, fight card and different kinds of fight cards that will really appeal. And you've got to have big names in there as well. But you've also got to have those opportunities, those kind of Apollo Creed, Rocky Balboa kind of fights that, well, he's come out of nowhere, then he's, you know, he's, he's shocked the world, that kind of thing. You know, that, that kind of thing, that's what you want. That's why the Rocky films were so popular, because it just... It just made you think, what could happen? What could happen if you got into the ring and you're a decent fighter and on that night, you stole the crown? You know, you you beat the man. You know, what would it be? I mean, let us know. I'm mean, kind of rambling. I, I had a whole list of about 10 videos to do. I've been so busy this week. I've kind of not been able to do any uh, videos at all, really. A few shorts here and there. But I had about 10 videos and I thought, you know what? I'm just going <laughs> to splurge it all out for you and let, and, let, and let me know what you think. But I, I, I was really impressed with the 5v5 card. I'm kind of really looking forward to uh, the fight cards coming up. The ones in August, um, obviously the uh, the September, the October as well, and obviously the December. This is all from the the Saudi. But there's so many other fight cards that that are just 
great, great to look forward to. I mean, sometimes the weight divisions in themselves, they, they need they need a, a big star to emerge. And you've got certain divisions, there are big stars in there. But it's maybe just one, maybe two. Sometimes you need more stars. And this is what I would say for all boxers. They need to make their profiles, their public profiles, a lot better than they actually than they actually have been. And they can learn a lot. And I think they are trying to, in all fairness. But you know, let's face it, all you know, not all boxers are, you know, a great great in front of a camera let's say you know so it's it's not always that easy to convert uh, somebody who's very a, a great boxer into a great personality and they kind of need to be able to showcase themselves a lot more to make themselves more appealing and that people want to watch and yes you could say that the only way they should do that is by showing us their boxing skills but they need more than that especially as with as the sport starts evolving especially as big money uh, influencers let's say like the sounders come in and say we want to put on big fights we want to you know we want to show the world what we can do we can bring boxing entertainment and for me this is what this kind of new wave is doing. It's bringing boxing entertainment back. And we probably haven't had that in a long, long time. I was saying before the 5v5 card that we probably haven't had this much attention on boxing since probably the 70s, very early 80s, something like that. Um, now we've got it back. And it's it's really, certainly here in the UK, it seems to have really uh, caught fire and I think it's great for the domestic fight cards as well. The Magnificent Seven Sons Queensbury. Uh, you know, the ones that Matchroom are putting on as well. The ones that Matchroom are putting on around the world via DAZN as well. I think this is great. This is great for the sport. But it's kind of being fueled and energised by, by the Saudis. Now, whatever your thoughts on, on the Saudis are, in terms of politics and everything, for me that's a, a separate issue, you know. And, and I, you know, I don't want to sort of bring that into it. We know why they're doing it, they're, and quite rightly so. They're bringing eyes of the world onto the, you know, to Saudi as a PR campaign, as a marketing campaign. I don't see any issue with that at all. If they want to uh, do it via sport, do it via boxing. The the key thing here is is that they are bringing us the fights. And as I said right at the start of this video, the problem is. I'm just greedy now. So if you are watching this, uh, Turkey Out of Shake, and if you are, your whole team, the whole government department, if you are watching it, I want more. I want more. That's the thing. I want more. I want you to deliver more. You know, I want you to produce fight cards that are stacked with world title uh, fights, with, you know, all heavyweights, all lightweights, or whatever it is, you know, all m great matchups. You know, Big names just getting together and uh, and seeing what we can do. That that would be fantastic, and that will be, you know, that will be boxing razzmatazz. That will be something that, well, let's face it, most people would be thinking, wow, 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 can't wait to watch that. And if you look, could you imagine? Could you imagine a fight card? Fury against Usyk, right? Or or. Maybe not even Fury is it like Fury AJ, right? Bivol Baterviev, Canelo Benavides, Inoue against uh, whoever, Terence Crawford on there as well, Javante Davis uh, on there as well. You know, or, or uh, Javante Davis against Haney or something like that. You know, whatever. All the way down, you've got. Bangers, and I'm and I'm talking bangers with world with world champions or would be world champions. That would be amazing. That would be amazing. It's almost like you kind of get this kind of super six type thing or some kind of tournament. You could have you could develop it into kind of a a, a contender tournament as well. Just say right, we're going to have loads of mini tournaments now just to see who is the man and who's going to fight. You know, this could be a complete change in boxing. The way we think about it, the way we view it. I've never liked the multiple world titles. I think it's a, a complete nonsense. I've never liked or fully understood or fully could really rationalise the rankings as well. It's so subjective. There's so many problems within the business of boxing, as we know. Very it's it's very shady behind the scenes. I mean, there's quite a few great articles about uh, 
how much boxers actually receive and how much you get paid. There's some great videos as well. There's some funny ones. There's this one guy. If you go onto YouTube, you see this one guy. It's almost like how how are purse bids made or something like that. Search that. You'll find this guy who's got a, a table full of cash. And he basically he, he breaks it down. And say you've got a hundred thousand uh, dollar purse, and the fighter is left with you know that. Once you've paid everybody off, once everybody takes their cut. And, you know, that's the thing. If you take away the promoters and the managers, and if the boxers could do a lot more of this themselves, they'd be able to keep a lot more of it. And it's only, it's only the really big fights for multiple millions. That's where the fighter actually gets to keep a lot of it. If they, if they don't, then they're, they're really being shortchanged here. But hopefully it might change how it evolves in the future. Who knows? Who knows what, what can happen? But I think the future is definitely bright. The future of boxing, I don't think it's secure. And I, I don't think it's there's a, there's a clear pathway to what we're heading towards. But I think change is coming. And the Saudis are the ones that seem to be generating the, that change. And it's that enthusiasm. Now, how long are they going to keep this up for? Is it only being driven by Turkey Al Sheikh? He's had his house problems, I believe. You know, what about if he's no longer in the picture? You know, if, if something he goes on to something else, or unfortunately he can't carry on in the future, let's say in the next 10 years, let's say, well then who takes over? What happens in the future? If the Saudis suddenly are not there, then do the promoters the next generation promoters, do they keep on putting on these fight cards? Do the boxers want to say, look, we just want to get in the ring and we want to fight? Are they willing to say, right, we'll, we don't have to keep on pushing for the big money. We'll just go in for the, you know, for, for the fights and, and let's just see what we can, if we can earn a decent amount of money, that would be much better for us. Let's just get these fights on. Who knows what's going to happen? You know, you could have a complete shift in the way we view boxing, we think about it, but also how the fighters are treated and paid as well. And ultimately, how quickly these uh, fights can be made. You know, it's not like a year of pussyfooting around and, and politics. It could be something that we're just like, yeah, you know, do you want to fight him? And you know, I go, yeah, we do. Right, you two, in the ring, away you go. It could be as simple as that. But listen, I thought we've had... A great weekend of boxing. I know you've seen all the videos and everything like that. I've been too busy to make a reaction videos on that. But there's so many things I've been thinking about in terms of what I'd like to see. And I just want to see more. And maybe you, you do too. Maybe you want to see more in the UK. Maybe you want to see more around Europe. Maybe you want to see more in Mexico or, or in the United States, for, for example. You just want to see more and more and more. Or maybe you're happy with what's going on in Saudi and you want to just see the ultimate fight cards there. I think I want a bit of everything. I want to see the ultimate fight cards in Saudi, if that's where they're going to be, the ultimate ones. You know, the the uh, world title fight card there. That would be fantastic. A complete dream matchups fight card. That would be great there. But we can have some fantastic fight cards around the world as well. You know, this, you know, the, the promoters should be very eager to jump onto this kind of enthusiasm of, of people wanting to watch uh, boxing. It's almost like boxing has suddenly taken 10 steps ahead of UFC, whereas before UFC was kind of going, <laughs> boxing, step out of the way, we're coming through. Now, all of a sudden, since the Saudis have come in and we get these great fights, all of a sudden, UFC has been, you know, slapped down and say, get back down where you belong. Boxing is number one, is king. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. What do you want to see? What next for world boxing? I can't wait. If you like what I do here, don't forget to like and share the video. Subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell for all future videos. And I will catch you again on another video coming very soon. I hope. Ta-da. So another Tank Davis win and Chris Billings Smith ekes it out to the very end. Let's get into it. Hello, welcome to Tommy Edson. I hope you're well. If you like what I do here, don't forget to like and share the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notifications bell for all future videos. So a great night of boxing last night where Tank Davis uh, beating Frank Martin uh, in in the eighth round, which he kind of predicted as well. Yeah, he, he came under a bit of pressure as well. His right eye was uh, quite marked up uh, by the end of the fight. But look, I thought Frank Martin was getting a bit of success there as well. 
certainly in those early rounds. But then Tank uh, Davis uh, just showed his class. Benavidez, a, a decent win as well. He's now calling out Canelo Alvarez as well. And they to debate whether he goes back down to super mid or stays a light heavyweight. We know that they're trying to make the Benavidez bivol fight in Saudi Arabia as well. So it's all looking good for Benavidez as well. That's from the United States. Liam Paro, a decent, uh, a decent win uh, out there in Puerto Rico against Sir Mariel as well. He feels uh, uh, humiliated with that loss. That was I was just catching up with the uh, the highlights of that fight this morning, so that was uh, decent as well. But the British card last night, Chris Milton Smith against Richard Reakpool, what a what a decent fight that was. Bit messy, you know, a bit hard to watch at times. It was all on the inside. There's a lot of clinching. You know, you gotta look at Reakpool. You know, he had opportunities, didn't really capitalise on them as well. But Chris Milton Smith dug in deep and uh, yeah, a lot of credit to him. He's now looking at uh, a unification fight, you know, is it against Jaya Pattaya, or, or are they going to try and go for an undisputed uh, fighter in the future as well, maybe under a Saudi card, who knows, who knows what's going to happen there, but it's looking good for Chris Billingsworth, a decent, decent fight, Chamberlain against Massey, again, a great fight, I was kind of predicting this is going to be a, a tight one, but what, what a banger that was, and then Massey coming out and win. I'd love to see that fight again. I've got to say, I'd love to see that run back as well. And then last, we've got Ben Whitaker as well. Uh, yeah, going the full 10, and uh, you know, you know, he came under a bit of pressure as well, but he won it convincingly. Nice little flurry at the end as well. And look, he goes on from strength to strength. And look, we've got to look at the opponents that he gets next. It's always the levels that he's got to rise to and what kind of opponents he's going to get. But he's, look, another sort of convincing win there from uh, Whitaker. But really, the spoils go to uh, Chris Mellon Smith against uh, Riappur as well. A very, very decent fight there. A very decent fight. One to uh, end the evening in uh, Crystal Palace, Ellis Park. And uh, look, what's next for Chris Billing Smith? What's next for Richard Riappur as well? You, you've got to argue. But next for uh, Chris Billing Smith, is it a bit too early for uh, Jaya Pattaya? I'm not too sure about that. I mean, he was talking about possibly a unification uh, fight for the WA title as well. And then maybe Jaya Pattaya gets the WBC bout as well. And then they just meet for the undisputed th thereafter. But whatever happens, a worthy winner last night from Chris Billum Smith. I picked him to win. Many people were going for Richard Riappor. On another night, it could have been another story. But for me, a decent win, a worthy winner in Chris Billum Smith. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If you like what I do here, don't forget to like and share the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notifications bell for all future videos. And I will catch you again in another video coming very soon. Well, whenever the next fight is. Ta da! Conor McGregor is out! Let's get into it. Hello, welcome to Tommy Edson. I hope you're well. If you like what I do here, don't forget to like and share the video, subscribe to the channel, hit the notifications bell for all future videos. So the news breaking this morning uh, was Conor McGregor is out of the UFC 303 with uh, Michael Chandler, of course. And this kind of has been going on for a long, long time. We thought we finally were going to get it. Then the press conference uh, last week in Dublin, that was kind of very short notice, surprisingly shocking the world was, was cancelled. That l meant that the whole UFC world went into meltdown, really, asking questions, what is happening, what's going on behind the scenes. Then there was like a little glimmer of hope. They said, no, no, it's all OK, it's all OK. You know, the fight is still on. And it was confirmed by UFC. No, he is out. McGregor is out. How long is he going to be out for uh, with this injury? You know, we, we really don't know. It could be three, four, five months. Now, there's talk, you know, it could be rescheduled for September. It could be, you know, December. Well, maybe even to next year as well. But how effective is Conor McGregor going to be? The problem is we're relying on the name as opposed to the, the, the fight in performance. Now, yeah, we match up against uh, Chandler. Really, I, I really like Michael Chandler as a fighter. I think it's great, great entertainment, great value to watch uh, him. And he gets busted up a lot, right? But seeing these two together be a great matchup. But I can't really say, hand on heart, that Michael Chandler is at the top of the game. Of course he isn't. And also, you can't really say that about Conor McGregor. He hasn't really fought in seven or eight years. He, what, he's got one one win uh, in, in that time? Maybe not even that. I, I can't even remember his full record. But 
they're, they're not right at the height of the game. So we're just going on name recognition here more than anything now. And Conor McGregor is still the biggest name in UFC. He's the biggest draw. He's the biggest pay-per-view. That's why people wanted to watch it so much. And that's why I'm sure so many people are so hacked off right now because they spent all that money for the UFC tickets and maybe having to travel there and, you know, uh, hospitality and hotels and all that sort of stuff. And it's just been wiped, you know, from beneath them. The, the carpet's pulled from beneath them now. They can't even enjoy that. They can't even enjoy watching it at home. So what what's left for conor mcgregor he's going to be what he's going to be 36 uh towards the tail end of this year you know he's it's he's on the decline he's of course he's on the decline we know that but even if he was at the top of his game it would still be on the decline for his age group now michael Chandler, what's he do does he go for a, another fight in the meantime well no he's gonna wait around for the big payday and they're basically just this has been going on for a year and a half and he's been pussyfooting around at the same time Conor McGregor, especially, is missing out on other huge opportunities. Other huge opportunities to get involved with Saudi cards, boxing cards, big money fights, let's say against Manny Pacquiao, who's supposed to be returning to the ring as well. You know, with there's going to be big kind of showbiz fights out there that you could definitely have. But obviously this injury and being still under contract with the UFC, he's never going to be able to get out under that contract. He's never going to be able to fight anywhere else. So he's, he's in a real sticky situation. I'm sure he wants to fight, but obviously maybe he just he physically can't fight. He's not being allowed to fight because of, of what he's got. So where does this leave him? It leaves him kind of getting older and older, being more out of tune, and having to match up with any other fighter who's got a big enough name that's still relatively competitive to be able to get in there and uh, have a duel. And that people will want to take it seriously enough to want to pay over their hard-earned money, to want to pay for the pay-per-view, which is no big deal, really, because most people will be able to do that. But it's actually the all club together to get a pay-per-view, to watch it around somebody's house, of course. Or you go to a bar and watch it. Or you can shout out the big money to uh, go and watch it in person and, you know, pay for all the extras as well. It's a, a diminishing rate of return, as it were. He's on the downward uh, edge, and there's, there's no way of denying that. There's no way of sugarcoating this. And you kind of waited for this for so long, and then again, for it to be cancelled again, it's just like... Oh, do we really have to wait? Do we really, you know, okay, forget it. Let's move on. Well, the UFC, fantastically for themselves, they have moved on in, in replacement for the McGregor Chandler fight. They've put Pereira again against Prohaska. And again, this was the light heavyweight uh, title fight a couple of fights ago. Pereira won. Some would say a little bit controversially because the fight was stopped too soon. I'm not so sure. I thought it was just a, you know, a beast of a fight. He's a two-division world champion. He's only been in UFC for a couple of years. He was a two-weight division in glory kickboxing as well. Pereira is just a beast. But he's coming off some injuries himself. I think he's got some foot injuries or toe injuries or something like that. He's been put in, or he's accepted to go in Prohaska. And he's a beast. He's going to want to right some wrongs. In his last fight, he did all right. So, and he showed he's got he's got the uh, the metal to stay in there as well. So, let's hey, this is a great fight. Any other fight probably would have disappointed UFC fans, but I think this is just going to be a fantastic fight. I mean, I, I love the UFC from a stand-up fighting point of view, a mainly stand-up point of view, and these both these boys can crack as well. Yeah, the ground game they can do that as well, but you know they can definitely crack, and I, and I'm really looking forward to this. Pelé in himself. I, I kind of see, if, if you're looking at anybody from the UFC world, who who you could, you could legitimately say, do, would they have a chance in crossover to boxing, right? Like a celebrity. For, I know we've had the Ngannou thing against uh, Fury and AJ, of course. And, you know, AJ showed him what's what, right? And we've had, uh, obviously, McGregor in the past against Mayweather, right? So we've had that. Yeah, we know what's what. But Perea, he's a different animal. You know, he's, he's kickboxing. And uh, this morning, I've just been reviewing some of his old kickboxing uh, uh, fights. Uh, and he was a two-weight world champion there as well. He was middleweight and light heavy. Same as in MMA. Middleweight and light heavyweight champion. The problem is that if you'd have to go across to boxing, 
he's at the he's about the 200 205 pound mark right now so the weight divisions are different in boxing so he'd have to go in either at bridge weight possibly cruiser weight bridge weight or he'd have to go into we have to bulk up and go into heavyweight now he's already said that he wants to go up to heavyweight in ufc i personally if he could if he could bring himself back down to middleweight and maybe for bivol at light heavyweight boxing to go up and have a catch weight contest there i think that would be fantastic i would love to see that in terms of coming over it against cruiserweight well, I, th I think you'd have to put him in against, you know, so you, you'd, could you put him in with a world champion, you know, like uh, Ngano did against um, against Fury and AJ? Oh, I, no, I don't think he could. But maybe. A lot, it depends how he does. If he, if he defends here and then if he goes up to uh, UFC heavyweight and challenges there, which he wants to, maybe gets him in Tom Aspinall, whether he goes straight in with John Jones, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? There'll be a big pull for some big celebrity fights. And I say celebrity, but you know what I mean. You know, big uh, mega star combat sports fights between a UFC, genuine UFC, who can who can box as well, and he can box, right, against, you know, a, a, an out-and-out -out boxer. And, I, you know, I would love to see it. If he came down and weight, catch weight with Bivol or Batyaev, I'd love to see that heavyweight. But I, don't, I doubt, doubt that would happen, right? too much of a weight gap he's he's gone he's grown up now so it's even have to be across to cruise away and well take any of the world champions right now to take any of the top 10 and let's see how we would do but then bridge weight okay i know a is just there but that's not really much of a division let's face it it'll either have to go up to heavyweight but the problems are heavyweight in boxing it is really heavy Okay, they are getting heavier and heavier. 250, 260, 270, in some cases 300. So, you know, I, I really can't see that happening. I'd, I'd say him coming across at cruiserweight, yeah, I'd say that's probably where he's most likely to, to go. But in terms of this matchup in the UFC being a, an, a, a suitable replacement for Conor McGregor, yeah, it's brilliant. But in terms of the, the draw, well, everybody's going to be deflated now. Everybody wants to see Conor McGregor back in the ring. Has he still got it? I don't think he has got it. He can't have it. He's been out of the octagon for too long. He's been out of commission for too long. He's had injuries. He's had, you know, he's gone off the wood. He hasn't exactly lived the lifestyle, has he? Now, obviously, yeah, coming back in. But maybe he's breaking down because of what he's having to put his body through just to try and get back into it. Michael China's still at it. He's still training every day. But it, is he still all that? Now, if you put... This is the same for boxers and UFC. And let me know if I'm completely way off base here. But let me know. Just because you're a world champion... It doesn't necessarily mean that you cannot be beat by anybody uh, who's in the rankings or even an unranked boxer or unranked UFC star or unranked MMA fighter. Anybody could potentially beat anybody. You just don't know it because you're not seeing those fights. You're not seeing those fights because the the new fighter hasn't earned their way up there as it were they haven't they haven't climbed up the ladder there is a process of having to climb up the ladder it isn't an open gladiatorial event right taking on anyone take on any newcomers yeah just come on in into the ring let's see what see what you got kid you know and then the then the champion just beats everybody no it's not like that no probably you could say well probably that's what we need we need to say if you want to be world champion you take on anyone Anyway, anyone who wants to get into the ring with you or the octagon, that's what it is. But we know this is a business, right? We know this is a business and nobody's going to allow a world champion, whether it's UFC, whether it's kickboxing, whether it's w whatever it is, whether it's boxing, to just get into the ring, get into the octagon with a nobody, okay? That nobody is going to have to prove themselves. But when you've got a world champion here and a world champion there, and then we're kind of saying, well, well, how would they do? Stylistically, how would they do? I think in terms of Pelea against a boxer, I think that's probably the closest matchup we'd ever have of having a decent fight, a, a, a competitive fight. But they'd have to match it up properly, right? The competitor would have to be right. The level would have to be right. Now, why am I saying this? Well, yeah, I'm disappointed that McGregor and the child is not happening. I'm very happy that Pereira and Prohaska is, is in there. 
I see Pereira as being pound for pound in UFC, but I also see him that he's got so much potential outside of the octagon as well. We know that the UFC are having negotiations with Saudi Arabia. We know what Saudi Arabia have done with the boxing card so far and that they want to set up their own boxing league. Are we going to see some kind of competitive crossover happening on a regular basis now that the saudis are going to push a lot more money into this and maybe take over a lot more and maybe bring a lot more fighters into their into their stable especially if they want to develop this boxing league especially if they're willing to pay for it okay there is talk of them buying out boxing promoters buying out management buying up all the the boxers that are concerned to fight under their banner now, I'm not so sure that's a great thing, but in terms of getting fighters together, whether it's boxers or whether it's uh, combat sports uh, fighters, to come into boxing, yeah, that's interesting. Let's not forget, let's not forget here, the boxers are headhunters. Yes, some styles, you know, do allow for a lot of body shots and wearing down the arms and everything like that. And that kind of comes into what UFC does a lot of, you know, a full body attack in, in many ways. But boxers are headhunters, whereas UFC, they're not used to having that that kind of punishment to the head on a on consistent basis. So it'd be very interesting to see if somebody is a decent boxer in UFC or has kickboxing background or even a boxing background, how they would do at any kind of level in boxing as a proper competition and not some gimmick fight, not some Ngannou going in there, not some even Conor McGregor going in there as well, right? I, I, this is where I see Pereira. I, I see him as a good crossover. But let us know. I could be completely wrong here. This is just an eyes on here opinion more than any kind of insight here at all. But I think the way the Saudis have gone with boxing and their kind of growing influence and their growing kind of pull and draw and what they want to do, I would not be surprised if we see some kind of negotiation with UFC to get more fighters to come over. I would not be surprised. But can't wait for UFC 303. Actually, can't wait for 304 as well, the Manchester card. Uh, that's going to be fantastic. And um, yes, great fights on there as well. Just, just a great load of fights coming up in UFC, which is really good. But I still think that what they're doing in boxing right now is just they're pulling away. So UFC really need to keep in the mix there, just to keep our attention. It's a different crowd. It's a different audience. I get it and all that kind of stuff and, and what we're kind of looking for in two different sports. But in terms of eyes on popularity... It was the UFC, then all of a sudden Saudis came in and lit the fire, then everything started to bubble up again in uh, boxing. So let's just see what happens there. But Pereira against uh, Brahashka, I hope I'm pronouncing that name right. What a great fight that's going to be. Can't wait. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If you like what I do here, don't forget to like and share the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notifications bell for future videos, and I will catch you again in another video coming very soon. Bye now. Let's talk Ryan Garcia and the Enhanced Games. Let's get into it. Hello, welcome to Omni Edson. I hope you're well. If you like what I do here, don't forget to like and share the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notifications bell for all future videos. So, Ryan Garcia, we know that he's just been banned, banned, you naughty boy, for a year for taking performance enhancing drugs, Osterine. It was in his system. Oh, it wasn't my fault. They're out to get me. It's all a conspiracy. Look, here's the tainted sample. It's all nonsense, right? The New York uh, Boxing Commission, Athletic Commission, they've, they've banned him for a year, right? So he's got a boxing ban. Well, you know, maybe fights once a year, twice a year at best. So therefore, it's no, no real problem, right? Lots of people have talked about this already. So I'm not really going to go into a deep dive on this. He should have got a lot more, minimum two, maybe even four. But where he has saved himself a little bit, in my opinion, is that he's he's got onto the case and responding to the failed drug test quite quickly. He's 
provided his samples quite quickly. He's kind of explained himself with his with his lawyers quite quickly. So the powers that be have been able to say, look, okay, fine, you've explained yourself, but it's still not good enough. Look, here it is. It's you know you've we've gone through the legal process, we've gone through the interrogation process. This is what it is. You got a tainted sample. Yes, no, we would take that. That's what it is. But you're still being banned for a year. Okay, great. Now, people are asking, well, you know, if Ryan Garcia only gets banned for a year, why is this whole spectacle with Conor Ben taking so long? I think it's a different process. And also think the way Conor Ben has also kind of responded to this and denied it, you know, and all the whole thing. This is why it's taken so long. They got into a he said, she said, and a tug of war over kind of position, really. And this is why it's taken so long. If Conor Ben uh, at the very start said, yeah, look, this is what it is. This is what I think it could be. Not really sure. They would have said, right, it's in your system. Therefore, there's a two-year ban or a one-year ban or whatever. People would have said, okay, fine. Fair enough. He didn't do it on purpose. It is what it is. That's what I believe it is. It's not my fault, but I take it on the chin. It would have been done and dusted by now. That's why it's taken so long with Conor Ben because they basically contested this the whole way and it's dragged it out for so long Ryan Garcia didn't okay so that's why they're both enhanced let's say now we saw the devastating effect of somebody who was enhanced but not only enhanced but also abused this the, the process of getting down to weight draining yourself down to weight and then fight it at a much healthier weight with your opponent now you could argue you could argue this and, and I've always thought this as well this rehydration is is complete nonsense. The way you should do it, I think they do this in the UFC. I'm not 100% sure on how close it has to be in the UFC. But when you enter the ring, that's the weight you should be within a margin, let's say 10, 20%. That's what you should be. So if you're in at a 140, 147, whatever it is, right, you have to be at that weight. That's what you're in at. You enter the ring, you go on a set of scales, and you go in. But we know that a lot of fighters, they balloon up when they rehydrate, especially with no rehydration clauses. They just could get up because they know the weight is going to be a lot more. So, so Ryan Garcia didn't drain himself all the way down. He was 3.2 pounds heavier. And you think, well, that's not a big deal. The thing is, he hasn't drained himself. So when he balloons back up, he's in a much healthier position. He's a bigger, stronger he doesn't feel as depleted. Devin Haney obviously does. Add the the osterine in his system. Now, whether it's beneficial or not, it's it's something that's in your system that shouldn't be there. You have you have as a, as an athlete, you have direct responsibility, absolute responsibility to know what's in your body. Brian Garcia didn't. He was abusing the system and everyone thought, oh, wow, this is amazing. He's tricked the world. He's, you know, he's fought a fantastic fight. And it was a great fight to watch, don't get me wrong. And it, you know, really beat up Devin Haney. But now we know, actually, this is wrong. This is wrong. He was enhanced. And he was enhanced not only by weight, by his strength, by an, an abusing the system so he didn't drain himself, didn't make weight, but also by this osterine. So therefore... He cheated and he, he threatened the life of his opponent because he was so much more enhanced. He got only got a year. For me, he should have got minimum two. It should have been four. In fact, I would have really put, gone to town and say, no, let's go five or six years because it wasn't just the PED. It was the whole process, the way he just came in overweight, abused the system, abused his opponent, and re seriously hurt his opponent. Fair play to Devin Haney. Didn't get, you know he went down repeatedly. He, he stood the test of time. He you know showed great resilience. He, sh he showed himself to be a great fighter to be in there. But he got completely beaten up. Now, okay, the fight has been annulled. They're trying to wipe the uh, the records of the fight. They're trying to wipe the footage of the fight and all this kind of stuff. You know, it, uh, you know, it happened. Everybody knew it happened. So you know, you can do what you want, Devin Haney. It, we all know that you got seriously beat up. But the point is, we know he cheated. So nobody is looking at you really badly now to say, "Oh God, you, know, you lost there." No, 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 you lost, but it was unfair. That's not right. If we're talking about boxing, 
this is the way it is. That's why you have boxing weight classes, okay? Because we always know that the bigger guy is usually always going to win over a smaller guy. In street fighting, let's say, in, in in just general power fighting, right? That's why you have weight classes. Weight classes are for a reason. We know that, right? In years gone by, in you know, in ancient times, why would the king's champion or the queen's champion always be the biggest oaf uh, in the army? Because you'd always win, right? You'd always be the one who's most power, and it'd be the hardest to get down. It was only until the invention of the gun, the great equalizer. Okay, that was supposed to be a gun. The great equalizer. That meant that it doesn't matter how big you are, how strong you are, a smaller guy can kill a bigger guy. The great equalizer. That's what the gun was called, right? So now you've got a system where we've kind of put all that aside. We're going to sporting, sporting battles on fair play, you know, a level playing field then Ryan Garcia is enhanced himself in more ways than one, then all of a sudden, you've really beaten somebody else. And it could have been a lot worse. It could have gone a lot worse. It's dangerous enough as it is. And then you've just completely abused that. So for me, you should have got a lot more. But this brings me on to my next point. Okay, there is a there is a almost like a, 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 a kind of a feeling out there so what he was enhanced? So what? So what people are taking performance arms and drugs? You know, there's lots of people out there saying, look, loads of athletes are taking it and they're going undetected. You know, they're not even admitting to it. I think it was the thing with some stat came out that only 45% of athletes or 45% of athletes, past athletes, admitted, admitted to taking PEDs. So that means that there's so much more. We know it's rife in other sports. You know, Tour de France, for example, which is starting today, of course. There's been a history of it. In other sports, it's been rife. And we know that in boxing, yeah, it, it can be an issue as well. So especially at the lower levels. We know this, this happens. And in other sports, it happens as well. So they so, say, well, it's no big deal. It is what it is if everybody's on it. But the point is you're not supposed to be on it. It's, they're supposed to be clean sports. It's about human, natural human ability against another natural human ability. And when you start cheating or going against the rules, that's what makes it really difficult. Now, in combat sports, as you know, it's an extra, extra issue because you're trying to hit the other guy or, or girl. You can cause serious damage. So performance enhancing drugs may make your performance better in executing your punches, let's say, make you fitter, make you stronger, powers of recovery, all this kind of stuff, right? But you're still getting hit in the face. So if you're getting hit in the face harder than you normally would, then you end up like Devin Haney, right? So you're gonna be you're gonna be hurt a lot more. So PEDs don't really protect your skull, don't protect your brain from extra impacts that's the point here so there is an outfit out there who are who are recognizing that there are lots of people lots of sportsmen and women out there of or lots of disciplines who are on performance enhancing drugs right so they're saying well oh the olympics you know everybody gets banned and everything so what we want to do is match up technology and science with human ability put PEDs, put enhanced drugs under medical control and see how enhanced, how great a human being can be. So they plan to have an enhanced Olympic Games or enhanced games. And they plan to try and do it by 2025. And they get, they're gathering momentum. This is all about the United States, right? They're gathering momentum, they're gathering funding. In fact, a lot of sports Companies, sportswear companies, are trying to get onto the bandwagon with them, like Nike and all these kind of big companies, right? I don't know if it's them specifically, but lots of big names are trying to get involved with them because they want to see the best human being with the, the best technology, whatever it is, to see if they're wearing our logo, they are the most best human being, right? 
So this is great. This is fine if you if you agree with PEDs. I don't, but if you do, that's fine. For something like athletics, for swimming, right? I think so far they've got five sports. They've got athletics, they've got swimming. <clears throat> I can't remember. There's a couple of other sports as well. But one of the sports that they have, in terms of the umbrella heading, as it were, is combat sports. In combat sports, they, they want MMA and they want boxing, right? Two combat sports so far by 2025. So you're going to have enhanced fighters jumping into this, this system, knocking seven shades of shit out of each other, and you're going to tell me that you're not going to have serious injuries or potentially even deaths? This is nonsense. So this is where the whole enhanced thing breaks down. You can produce better fighters. You can produce stronger fighters. But does not mean that those fighters will be able to withstand that punishment. And this is the problem with enhanced drugs or, or, or performance enhancing drugs. It doesn't make you more resilient. Now, if we're talking about a 100 meter dash or, you know, a, a 50 meter swim or, I, I don't know, a high jump or something like that. OK, you're not actually hurting anybody else. You're just having a, a performance of human ability, right? Or, or a comparison of human ability. That's a different conversation. I can see where you're at. I don't agree with it because I think it's unnatural. But if you want the best of human uh, achievement, I can see that there is a place for it. And look, sports companies and sportswear companies, they can see it as well. They're jumping on the bandwagon here and I can see it. And they've already got millions and millions of funding for it to produce these games. The, the key thing is, is trying to get athletes in on it to join over. Because once they've joined over, they, they can't go back into the Olympic movement. They can't go back into normal sports. They have to sacrifice their career to jump onto this, right? So that's probably going to be the big stumbling block. How many people are they going to be able to get involved in this? I don't think. Or how many top quality people are they going to be able to get into this? I'm not sure they will. But when it comes to combat sports, you're hitting somebody else. It's about your strength over somebody else. It's about your, your ability to hit somebody over their ability to hit you. Now, that's the same for natural, right? But at least it's natural against natural. We know that it's it's within the, the it's within the realms of a human being. It's not an enhanced human being. It's not another enhanced human being. The only way that you're going to be able to allow this is to wear some kind of head protection. But even then, that's not really going to change much either. So, when the likes of Ryan Garcia only get a year for performance on the drugs, when the likes of Con and Ben. It's, it's taken, what, nearly two years now, and he's still fighting his, his case, really. When other athletes in the past, other boxers have failed their tests, the, the, the net result here, it's not necessarily that they failed a test. It's the potential damage that they could cause on their opponent. And no, no more so have we seen this when Ryan Garcia against Devin Haney Devin Haney, in my opinion, was lucky to get out of there with the damage that he did sustain. It could have been a lot worse for him. Ryan Garcia is unashamed. He doesn't care. And I, I, I think there's obviously some issues going on there with him as well. So not only for the PEDs, but also for the way he approached the fight, I think he should have been banned for a minimum four years, maybe even six years. It would have told the boxing world, boxers, combat fighters, the world over, we're not standing for this. You're not doing this in, in our sport. It's not happening. They didn't take a strong stance. And that's the problem in boxing as a whole. They haven't taken a strong enough stance against this. So whilst there might be an undercurrent of people, even fans out there saying, oh, it's performance on his drugs. It doesn't make a difference. So what? Who cares? Who cares? He still whipped his ass. The thing is, you're not on the receiving end of that. And when you see injuries, like many people have, in real life, right, in everyday life, you see how fragile the human body is, can be, then all of a sudden you're, you're expecting somebody to go into a ring, into an octagon, and fight somebody who is enhanced, then you're just opening up that fighter to, well, potentially life-changing injuries or even death on a regular basis. What, are we taking this sport way back to gladiatorial times where, hey, they leave their life in the ring? No.
That's that's not the way it should be. So this is where we needed to have a cultural check on what we think about fighters, about boxers, about performance items and drugs, but also about an enhanced games. Do we think it's going to be a good thing? I can see it from a non-combative kind of aspect. But in combat sports, no, I don't see this at all. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. But the enhanced games. They could be coming for 2025, latter end of 2025. They could be coming and it could include combat sports. I definitely don't think this is a good idea. I think it's a terrible idea. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. But Ryan Garcia, for me, he can just do one as well. If you like what I do here, don't forget to like and share the video, subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell for all future videos. And I will catch you again on another video coming very soon. Bye now. So weekend of boxing ahead, let's get into it. Hello, welcome to On Me Edson. Hope you're well. If you like what I do here, don't forget to like and share the video, subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell for all future videos. <gasps> so this coming weekend, uh, Binham Smith against React Poor. A fight that I'm really looking forward to, but who's going to win? Now, many of the pundits, many of the experts out there are going for React Poor. They're saying, you know, he's definitely going to win. Uh, it was a bit of a tussle last time out. I think it's about five or six years ago they fought, didn't they? And uh, React Poor won in a points decision. Ben Smith has gone on to uh, great things now, uh, becoming the Cruiserweight WBO champion, of course, uh, in recent years. He's had a title defense. Wasn't that really impressive in, in the last uh, fight? And... Uh, Many people say, well, you know what? He always kind of makes a, a, a hard work of his fights. And uh, maybe React Paul come in and expose that. That's why a lot of people go for React Paul. I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure that it's going to be as clear cut as that. I think it's going to be a, a fair old dust up, that's for sure. I'd, I'd, I'd like to say this is not going to go the full distance. I think it's going to be a knockout. Either either fighter is capable of a knockout here. I've just got a feeling that Chris Billum Smith is going to do it. He's he's going to dig deep, and and he's going to he's going to prove a lot of people wrong. But as I say, I'm really looking forward to this fight the, this uh, coming weekend. Really looking forward to the undercard as well. Uh, Chamberlain against Massey for the Commonwealth and European uh, title as well. Be really interesting to see if Chamberlain comes out on that and whether he then goes the whole uh, world title route or whether he has to step back to a uh, British title uh, route and maybe get in with Chef Clark as well. That'd be very interesting. We've also got, don't forget, Vidal Riley waiting in the in the wings as well to see well who is he going to uh, fight next. He was trying to call out Isaac Chamberlain. You know, Chef Chart was getting in there as well. So there's there's a bit of a, a three way kind of uh, fight duel going on there, and we'll, we'll see what happens there in the future. But. On the undercard of that, we've got Ben Whitaker in again as well, the big showman um, that has uh, taken the internet by storm, or the boxing internet by storm over the last year as well. Uh, he's fighting the uh, Aaron Yaker uh, guy who stormed his press conference last time out, and uh, well, he's got himself into into a fight, and fair play to him, but... It's always that, that thing about Ben Whittaker. Yeah, he's a showman. Yeah, he's been kind of, you know, labelled as the, the next uh, Prince Nassim Hamed as well. Even Nas has come out and said, well, you're just kind of copying really. And he's come out and said, no, I'm not copying. I'm doing my own thing as well. Look, we know it's about levels, isn't it? And as he steps up in levels, is he still going to be able to get away with the showboating as as Prince Nassim did, and he did it fantastically well, and what a great fighter he was. But as he steps up, is he going to be able to continue this, or is he going to get caught? Because he does get caught quite a lot, and his last uh, fight out, yeah, he was tested, he went the distance, he won the fight, no doubt. But, you know, it, it, we're not talking British level. We're only talking areas level there at that stage. So, you know, he's getting onto these cards. He's going to have to step up. He's going to have to keep on proving himself and keep on proving himself as he steps up the levels. It'd be very interesting to see how he gets on, not only in this fight, but the next fight. I, I'm not so sure that he's going to do so well in this fight. I think he's going to struggle uh, against uh, this opponent. We'll see. We'll see how that goes. But a nice nice undercard there for the Billum Smith against uh, Riyadh Paul fight. That's taking place at Crystal Palace, of course. All eyes of the football world are turned to the uh, Euros this uh, weekend, starting on Friday with uh, Germany against uh, Scotland, of course. So it's fitting that Billum Smith Riyadh Paul fight is at Riyadh Paul's favourite uh, football club, uh, which is Crystal Palace. I mean, 
you know, not so sure that's something to celebrate, but there we there we go. Uh, but anyway, so football fans are going to the Euros, but I'm sure some of uh, will be sticking around for the boxing uh, on Saturday night. Right. The other big boxing event is going on in the United States. Big, big card there. About 14, 15 fights or something. But the two notable fights, really. Tank Davis, a uh, headline against Frank Martin. There's been some shenanigans behind the scenes there, hasn't there? You know, whether Tank Davis has been right to criticise not only the promotion, but maybe the other fighters on the card. So there's something bubbling beneath the surface, and you kind of wonder, is this the right fight for Tank Davis? You know, should he have fought some better opponents? Should he have fought uh, other opponents uh, a lot lot sooner? Uh, should he have dodged other fighters? So it's... It's a little bit, it's a little bit up in the air whether this fight is a decent fight. Uh, certainly, the the pundits, certainly the uh, the betting is all going towards Tank Davis, and I will go that way too. I can't really can't see him losing this fight. He is in the pound for pound list as well. A fantastic fighter, but you do kind of wonder about the opponents he's picking, and also, well, should he be fighting other fighters as well uh, who are you know at his level, let's say, but. We'll find out, won't we? The other really intriguing fight is Benavides against uh, Zvodek as well. Look, this is a decent matchup, no, no doubt. But look, I want to see Benavides against Canelo. I want to see Benavides against Bivol and Batiriev. You know, Turkey Al Sheikh from Saudi, he's also saying, look, yeah, Bivol, we're going to get you Benavides uh, in here as well at some point. So I kind of want to see these big fights. I'm not sure... Benavides on this undercard is the right place for him. I think he should be headlining as well. So be very interested to see what goes on. I, I can't see anything but a Benavides win here, I've got to say. But look, those two great cards uh, this coming weekend. I've got to say, on the Tank Davis undercard, many of those fights I'm really not that interested. I'll be kind of, a, I'll be interested in the results and maybe get some highlights, but I'm not going to stay up all night just to watch those, I've got to say. Yeah, the Tank Davis fight, Benavidez fight, yeah, I'll be interested in those, but the others, can't say I'm really that interested. Let us know your thoughts on that. Um, certainly the Billum uh, Smith against React Paul and the undercard fights, yeah, I'm interested in those and I'll be watching those as well. But obviously, I'm also looking at the football this weekend, so which starts uh, Germany against uh, Scotland on Friday. What else has been happening in the boxing news well the big news coming out a couple of days ago is that apparently saudi arabia turkey al sheikh pof have, they want to set up their own boxing league but what does this mean what does this mean for the rest of the commissions the bounce was is, is this just another another bout that's going to come on the line is this going to be like a ufc type thing um, who knows but but the reaction to this has got to be from that you would say, like from the WBC, WBA, WBO, IBF, IBO even, let's say. The the fifth belt holder, if you even consider it about, right? They're going to be thinking, what the hell is going on? And also the fighters and the promoters and the managers, where do they stand? Are they going to be able to go to this boxing uh, league? Uh, how well are they going to be paid? Are they going to be banned from competing uh, for the other bouts, you know, if they go to this boxing league, how often will they be fighting? How many fighters will the boxing league need in their stable to make this a going concern where, where people are going to be invested to want to watch this? You know, they're going to have to have the really big names to want to go over there. Many of those big names, I'm sure, will not want to go over there. There's a lot of those American fighters who they are not really that interested in going over there. They want everything to be in the United States. They're not great travelers, a lot of the American fighters. Sometimes they have been, but not all of them. So it'd be very interesting to see how that develops, how the kind of politics plays out. Look, many people have always said, and I, I kind of always said this as well, having four or five world champions is ridiculous, you know, and interim world champions. is It gets too confusing. It's it's a nonsense, really. You've got WBC, then you've got uh, IBF champions, and they're, oh, we're world champions. Well, who is the world champion? Even people make the comparison with the, uh, the UFC. They say, oh, well, UFC is the world champion, right? Well, they're not. They're only the world champion under the UFC platform. What about PFL? What about ONE? What about all the, the European uh, fighters as well? Just because they don't fight in the UFC doesn't necessarily mean that the UFC champion is the, the world champion, is the best out there. So the same argument has always been for the bouts, the four bouts, the four major bouts, right? Well, who is actually the world champion? Well, let's say Usyk now is undisputed. Anyway, Crawford undisputed you could say 
hand on your heart that they are the world champion. But it takes so long for this to happen. Maybe with this boxing league, maybe it's just another way to say, no, we're going to see the best of the best come in here, not sanctioned by these other the boxing commissions. You're going to come in here and we're going to see who the best of the best is. That's intriguing. That's exciting. Let's just see what happens. But it's the reaction from the the other bouts, the commissions, uh, the, the governing bodies around the world, but also the promoters and the managers. You know, where do they fit into this? You know, if it's all taken in house, then you don't need a promoter anymore. You don't need managers. Well, kind of you don't really need managers anymore you know you what you to negotiate fights what because it's all going to be in house so how's that going to play out is there going to be a lot of friction we always knew that saudi arabia were going to do more than what they were started with you know bringing us these big boxing fights the the question is this next step is it going to be welcomed and what will be the reaction from everybody else around the world when it finally materializes when we really fully see what this is going to be but if this means it's just going to be another bout another competition then i've got to say i'm really not that interested unless we're seeing world champion against world champion unless we're seeing unifications unless we're seeing you know a whole card of world champions like i said in my previous video if turkey El shake if they can bring us these mega cards that will only be within this boxing league fine i'm i'm all in i'm all in but if it's just going to be another bout that's going to compete and you're going to have some fighters going that way and some fighters going the other way it's it's a bit of a nonsense to me. Let us know your thoughts on that. The other big news here this week is obviously that uh, Jake Paul uh, is not fighting Mike Tyson. That's been postponed until November time something now because of uh, Mike Tyson's uh, health issues, of course. But then we kind of think, oh, okay, well, should that have ever been a fight anyway? You know, so yeah, yeah I've made a video about that uh, already. But the stand-in for this is Mike Perry, right? Mike Perry's come from uh, UFC, didn't do so well there really, then went to bare knuckle uh, boxing, done great there. He's a champion there, five undefeated fights but my my problem here is that you jake paul and mike tyson went to netflix they sold the idea that it would that they knew that the boxing fans around the world may or may not want to watch it. we probably don't buy into it but the wider world would definitely want to watch this mike tyson is one of those crossover names that not only combat sports fans, but members of the general public know who he is. Even if you're not a boxing fan, you will know who Mike Tyson is, just like you will know who Muhammad Ali is, right? He's a crossover name. Everybody knows who Mike Tyson is. That's why Jake Paul went after him. It's a massive name. That's why Netflix entertained this. It was a massive name. Selling out a 90,000-seater stadium, selling pay-per-views all around the world, launching Netflix into this boxing arena. Yes, it all made sense from a commercial point of view, from an eyes-on point of view. It made perfect sense. Now Mike Tyson's out of it. It doesn't make sense in that context for Mike Perry to come in. The only reason Mike Perry comes in, in terms of a competition, making a competitive fight, makes perfect sense for combat fans, right? Boxing fans. But even boxing fans, you kind of look at that and you go, well, Mike Perry isn't a great boxer. He's not. He's not a great boxer, right? And Jake Paul isn't a great boxer. So you think, well, maybe they're at the similar kind of level. Maybe then it would be competitive. But if you're a real boxing fan, you kind of think, well, hold on a minute. If Jake Paul has always said oh, he wants to go up to world champion, right? He wants to go that route, professional boxing. Then give us a proper boxing contest. But the problem is his hands are tied now because he's, he's dialed into this Netflix event. He has to produce somebody that can sh sell a show that is going to be competitive. Okay, so we've got the competition now at your level, at Mike Perry's level. Okay, I'll get it. There's a lot of intrigue from the uh, uh, from the bare-knuckle boxing fans, I'm sure. There's a lot of intrigue from UFC. There's a lot of intrigue from general combat sports fans, boxing fans, right? We kind of understand the levels, right? Get it. But it, it's not the show, is it? It's not the extravaganza that Netflix and Jake Paul and Mike Tyson was going to deliver. So it fails on that. So it brings back a bit more of a combat sports credibility, competitiveness challenge, but it fails on that, that big spectacle. 
So you kind of wonder what the hell is going on here. I understand that, you know, maybe Netflix, <laughs> maybe they're, they're under a bit of pressure themselves. They've come under scrutiny for this baby reindeer fiasco and, and questioning their decision making here. Now you want to question their decision making and whether, whether they should continue this event. Why do they need a stand in on this event? Maybe they just scrap the event, wait until Mike Tyson comes in. But maybe they're under contract. Maybe they've got deadlines. Maybe they're already down the road too too far. So it brings into question their decision making again. Well, hold on a minute. Why have you invested so much effort into a 27-year-old against a 57, 58-year-old? It was always going to be subject to health issues and, you know, so many external variables that can affect this or where this fight would ever take place. So putting all your eggs in one basket, this has come to bite your ass now. Now you're drafting in a bare knuckle boxer, great, a lot of eyes will come into it, but it's not going to sell a 90,000 seater stadium, and it's certainly not going to have the pay per views around the world that you thought that Mike Tyson would bring. So all of a sudden, it's failing already. The model is failing. What you probably should have done is just cancelled the event, postponed it for the when Mike Tyson comes back online, as it were, and maybe as an MVP promotion from uh, Jake Paul, and maybe from Netflix, just downsize it and take it to another event. So we're going to have this as a as an initial boxing event, Netflix, yeah, we're going to sell pay-per-views, but it won't be as much, and we're going to move it to, let's say, a big arena somewhere, yes, yeah, still in Texas or whatever, but it's, it's not going to be the big football stadium. You know, it could just be that you just downsize it. But no, it seems as if they're going to go all in on it as well. I'm not so sure this is the right way to do it. But there we go. So, Jake Paul's now fighting Mike Perry. Yeah, maybe a more of a competitive fight. i definitely have Mike Perry on, on that to, uh, to win. But, hey, l let's see what happens. I still don't see why uh, Mike Tyson, uh, you know, should be stepping into the ring with uh, Jake Paul. I'm sure many people agree, but I'm sure many people out there would disagree as well. You know, I really don't know what's the point of that fight. I'm more interested now to watch Jake Paul against Mike Perry, in all fairness, than I am against watching... Jake Paul against Mike Tyson. But then again, I am looking at this from a combat sports uh, fan, from a competitive fighting sports fan, and not from just somebody who wants to watch some kind of spectacle, some kind of circus show, right? So that's my, my angle. But look, Saudi Arabia, they're, they're going uh, all in on the boxing now, it appears, and they want to expand it even more. We've got these free boxing events that Netflix want to get involved in. We've got to see what happens there. The whole model of boxing seems to be changing from lots of different quarters. It seems to be being pulled in different directions from different countries, different promoters, different uh, viewing platforms as well. So it would be very interesting to see what happens in the next 12 months, even a couple of years, let alone five or 10 years, uh, and uh, how, how the sport evolves and where you're going to be able to watch it and who's going to be fighting who in the future. I mean, let's face it, you know, at this stage, you know, you could have uh, Jake Paul resurrect Gandhi at this point and say right let's have a fight and see what happens I mean it's just it's just bonkers isn't it really but anyway Jake Paul is going to fight Mike Perry apparently are they going to do it some kind of catch weight what's going to happen you know I'm I'm not convinced it's a great idea either but but there we go so he's fighting Mike Perry the undercard uh, for that fight is going to continue so at least uh, other people are getting to, to fight as well we've got some decent cards coming up uh, this coming weekend but some interesting thoughts on the, the D Davis and uh, Frank Martin fight as well and and also the whole undercard and see well how many fights are on there and are, are they great fights really um, got Saudi Arabia doing their thing and let's not forget that Tyson Fury has been face planting the curb this week after drunken stupor as well what do we make of that i mean it's all going off in the boxing world isn't it let us know your thoughts in the comments below if you like what i do here don't forget to like and share the video subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell for all future videos and i will catch you again on another video coming very soon bye now AJ wants to fight everyone. Let's get into it. Hello, welcome to me, Ed Sun. I hope you're all well. If you like what I do here, don't forget to like and share the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notifications bell for all future videos. So, Anthony Joshua, he wants to have a little bit of a tussle with everybody. We know now he's going to be fighting uh, Daniel Dubois in this September fight card uh, by Turkey El Sheikh, of course, for Riyadh season. It's coming to Wembley. It's coming home. So, 
he wants to fight Dubois. They had a bit of afters uh, in their little head-to-head, -head, their sort of preamble, and then it got a little bit heated. AJ didn't take too kindly to uh, Daniel Dubois calling him out, saying, hey, if you want to go, we'll go now. And uh, AJ said, hey, cool your horses there a little bit there, fella. Uh, show a bit of respect. Now, I want to touch on this first of all before I get into the other little shenanigans that AJ's been up to. I'm not so sure if AJ is right to think that Daniel Dubois is being disrespectful to him in particular just because Daniel Dubois said to him, we'll go right now. What I do think it is disrespectful to the sport because we all know that nobody should be getting into any kind of fisticuffs before the actual fight. Certainly the promoters don't want that. Certainly the uh, the broadcasters don't want that. Nobody wants that. And maybe AJ's thinking exactly the same. What are you doing? What are you saying? Such stupid things like that. You're not only disrespecting the sport, you're showing yourself up. And yeah, yeah, you're disrespecting me because I'm a professional. It's very unprofessional. This is probably what AJ's thinking. You're a little jumped up little twerp and you're being disrespectful. So I kind of, I'm, I'm with AJ on this. I'm with AJ. Think, oh, hold on a minute there, fella. You know, cool your horses. What the hell's going on? So quite right, he had a bit of a go at him. Now, was this ever going to descend into chaos and fisticuffs at dawn? No, uh, you know, too many people there were going to get involved. In fact, security jumped on uh, Daniel Dubois straight away, pulling him out. Noticeably, I don't think anybody jumped on AJ. I mean, why would you? Let's face it. Now, so like they, they, they've had a bit of, they've had a bit of previous, haven't they? Apparently. Daniel Dubois has kind of confirmed, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've uh, put AJ on his ass. Well, that was a long, long time ago, and that was inspiring, and we all know inspiring, anything can happen, and it's about training, it's about getting yourself fit, getting yourself match fit, as it were, fight fit, as it were, ready for the contest. So, yeah, I mean, these things happen, so, you know, but Daniel Dubois got put on his ass in training, didn't it, or in sparring, I should say, by Hergovic, and, well, guess what? Dubois beat Hergovic, so it makes no sense. It, it's it's silliness just to bring that up, in my opinion. It happened a long time ago, the amateur days, I mean, who cares? So now we've got Daniel Dubois versus Anthony Joshua. Is it a good fight? Great undercard, by the way. Great undercard. And we know that. It's, it's a great undercard. They're delivering the goods. The one thing I would say, and I think a, a couple of other people have sort of commented as well, Josh Warrington's on there. And, and, and I just wonder why Lee Wood isn't on there. You know, they've been wanting to make this fight for a long, long time. And I believe it's been about the money, been about the purse. Then, well, then surely there, there shouldn't be an issue on purse now. Because the Saudis is involved. So why isn't Lee Wood there? Now, I don't know. It's all gone really quiet on the Lee Wood front, but that's another story, I'm, I'm sure. And if you know the, the the reason, let us know in the comments below. But AJ Dubois, let's just concentrate on that. Is it going to be a, a, a decent fight? I believe it would be. Does Daniel Dubois have any kind of chance? Of course he does. He has a great chance. Do I think he's going to win? Absolutely not. I think AJ is way too advanced for Danny Dubois. In fact, in many ways, I cut, lots of people have been waxing lyrical about Danny Dubois in recent days, especially since this uh, fight has been confirmed. Oh, he did great against Hergovic. He did great against Joao Miller. You know, he's had those couple of setbacks against Usyk, who is the undisputed. And obviously he had that Joe Joyce as well. But he has the orbital was uh, blown as well. You know, there's been lots of kind of reasons why Daniel Dubois no is a great fighter and he is he is fantastic and now he's been promoted to the IBF world champion by default which is a bit of a nonsense and we know the bout thing is a complete nonsense and we know you know the reason why Usyk had to give up his bout is a complete nonsense it's all about money it's all about clout and it's all about you know sticking to the rules as it were you know certainly in terms of the IBF but is he any good now, people have been saying also that the fighters that uh, Daniel Dubois has been fighting recently are much better calibre than Anthony Joshua. I, 
you could say that on paper, but it's Raul Mera has been out the the, uh, the the mix for quite a while before he came back in, and also Hervich hadn't really fought uh, that much at all. In fact, you know he, he Tamori he fought, which on one of the first Saudi undercard that was just complete nonsense. And then uh, he, he, I think the last fight was uh, was it Shitty Shang? I don't know. It was a long time before then. You know, hardly an impressive performance. Everybody said, oh, you know, IBF number one Hervich, he's fantastic. You know. He's, he's great. He wasn't that great. He wasn't at the races at all. So why do I think AJ would win? You could say about he fought lesser opponents. He dispatched the Vingano just easily, didn't he? It was a joy to watch, in fact, because he just showed what boxing should be, right? Against a non-boxer. So that's that was the great thing. And against, you know, Hellenius and Franklin and Otto Wallen, you know, he, he sort of dispatched them as, as we went on. With Helenius, of course, and Wallen, of course, Franklin was uh, just his first fight back, wasn't it, after Usyk. So he got better and better and better, more accomplished, more confident, especially under Ben Davidson as well. They're, you know, everything's going right for AJ. But why do I think AJ would easily beat Dubois? And, I, and I'll tell you why. It's because Dubois is open, wide open. He's so, uh, he can punch, no doubt. And if he clips you, you know, you, you're going to be in trouble. And it's going to be a battle of who can take a punch here, who can take sustained punches, and who can leave themselves open enough to get hit. And for me, Daniel Dubois is that fighter who's going to get hit. He's going to get hit a lot. And who is the best hitter, the most powerful hitter, puncher? Well, it's AJ, isn't it? So, for me, there is no contest here. And I kind of wonder why Dubois has been put into the ring with AJ. It seems as if, it seems as if Frank Warren is using Daniel Dubois, and I don't know if anybody else has mentioned this or even thought this as well, he's putting Daniel Dubois in as a little tester. A tester for fury. Why do I say that? Well, Damien, Daniel Dubois came out of nowhere, kind of, to fight Usyk. And then guess what? Usyk then fights Fury. Daniel Dubois comes out of nowhere, really, I suppose, to fight AJ. He wasn't in the mix. He wasn't in the conversation uh, a few weeks ago. And then all of a sudden, he has that fight against Hergovic, and there's nobody else around, really. And then, oh, yeah, this is a great matchup. Well, now we know that, well, we're definitely looking at the first quarter, second quarter of 2025. They... The Saudis, Turkey El Sheikh, they want Fury AJ. So it's almost like, wow, well, let's just see how you do against AJ. Let's just see how you do against Usyk. I don't know, maybe a bit of conspiracy theory going on there, but that's the kind of way I, I feel about it. It does feel a little bit kind of, you're just putting him into the lion's den and see how he goes. Now, he's more than capable of doing well, don't get me wrong. And I'm convinced that he is going to be a future world champion. When this group, this generation, the Furies, the AJs, the Usyks, of course, and even, even let's say, the Joe Parkers of this world step down, he's going to be right there. He's 26, what, 26 now, 27. He's going to be that next guy. He's taken a few losses to big names, but he's going to rise to the top. He's going to pick about something. I wouldn't be surprised if Daniel Dubois becomes undisputed champion in the future. But, big but, big, big but here. He does look as if he's just going through the motions right now. He looks vacant a lot of the time. He looks as if he's a bit scared a lot of the time. There's a kind of nervous look behind the, the stone face that he has now. It's almost like he's he doesn't know where to go. He has to be manhandled. He has to be pushed into position. Whereas AJ is a confident guy. 32 now, 33, is he? Something like that. He's been around the block. He knows everything. And that's probably why he reacted the way he did to Daniel Dubois. He said, like, what are you saying? Don't, you know, show some respect here. Daniel Dubois has almost like been told, no, no, just just have a go at AJ a little bit. Just, you know, stick it in a little bit. Let's see what let's see what he does. Oh, do you think I should do that? Yeah, I think you should do that. Yeah. It's almost like he doesn't, re it's not coming from him. It's coming from other people. Just like when he's in a fight, he has to be told what to do over and over again. And maybe that's the difference. And maybe you can't you can't teach somebody on the fly 
how to defend yourself. Just with Joe Joyce, Joe Joyce is so open, right? Great hitter, massive power, but so open. So if you've got somebody as skilled as AJ, you're going to pick them apart. This is where I see AJ under Ben Davidson as well, just picking apart Daniel Dubois. I just think it is. And I got a sneaking feeling Daniel Dubois is almost like the sacrificial lamb for fury against AJ to see how they're going to match up. Let us know your thoughts here in the comments below. But, you know, do I think that this is a great fight? That one that's going to get the juices flowing? Absolutely. Do I think it's going to be a good spectacle? Yeah. Will it go the diff distance? I don't think so. No way. I think it's going to be... A, I wouldn't be surprised if this is a round four, round three or round four knockout for AJ. Especially if, if Daniel Dubois uh, leaves himself open. Daniel Dubois has also got to watch out for any point deductions for his head because he's so lucky not to get disqualified in the last fight. In my, in my opinion, against Hergovic, his, his just head is all over the place. So he has to watch that. And AJ has probably been looking at that. He said, look, step back, uppercut, he's out of there. And, you know, that's what I'm thinking. It's going to be quite an easy, convincing win. I could be proven wrong. Daniel Dubois could put on a masterclass there and take out AJ with his power punches as well. And let's just see how resilient each man is under those heavy blows. But for me, this is no disrespect to Daniel Dubois. I think he's going to be a future world champion. I think he could even be future undisputed when the, the current crop uh, all retire. But right now, not right now. And it's no disgrace to lose to Joe Joyce when you were a lot younger. To lose to the undisputed, future undisputed champion that was Alexander Usyk. And the two-time world champion that was AJ in a world title fight. It's no disgrace there. You're at 26. Just think where Daniel Dubois can be in three, four years' time. If he can keep his confidence together. If he can keep this, this train moving. He'll be a great uh, boxer. He'll be a great champion for Great Britain. But against AJ, too early. He doesn't have the tools. AJ is going to wipe the floor with him. I'm afraid. That's well, that's what I'm what I'm thinking. But we know that this is all the precursor because Fury has to fight uh, Usyk again in December. We've had AJ with Tokyo El Sheikh on the phone to, uh, to Fury saying, look, oh, I'm going to fight you, I'm going to fight you. And there's a bit of back and forth, there's a bit of banter between the two. I like that. I like the banter between Fury and AJ. They're coming face to face. He's like, oh, I want you, I want this. And, you know, Fury say, no, you got to beat Dubois first and all this. You know, it's it was quite, if you haven't seen the clip, go watch it. It's really funny. So there's there's a bit of that. So that's to look forward to. Who's the driver to get these two finally together? The Battle of Britain. And, you know, if Fury beats Usyk, which I guess is another video, but I think he could, right? I think he could beat Usyk in the rematch. It's always ifs and buts, right? But I think he could. Then it'd be a great match. It'd be a great matchup at either way. If Fury loses, then it'd be the two losers to U Usyk who come together. If Fury wins, then it'd be for another undisputed because I believe AJ will beat Dubois and he will uh, be IBF world champion. Three-time world champion. It'll be an illustrious company for that. That mantle alone will be illustrious for AJ. So we're going to get that fight. Fantastic. Brilliant. We're going to get that fight. Can't wait for that. It's almost like the Fury Usyk fight and the Dubai AJ fight. I kind of want those out of the way because I want the Fury AJ fight. I desperately want that. And I've got a feeling, you know, hand on heart again. I don't have a dog in this race, but the way the confidence that AJ is showing, and then maybe the false bravado that Fury always displays, but I think now he's he's really got egg on his face because he lost. He did lose to uh, Usyk, and I'm convinced he lost uh, by three or four rounds. Uh, I, I would say he lost to at the minimum. Does Fury still have it? That's the the point I'm uh, asking. Does Fury still have it against Usyk? Does he have it against AJ? Confidence against false confidence. I think it's going to be a great matchup, but I think uh, AJ will win. Finally, I want to touch on AJ. He's been at it. He's been in the news with everybody. He's been uh, having verbal fisticuffs with the. Uh, Carl Froch, super middleweight, four-time world champion, 90,000 at Wembley Stadium, oh, I'm this, I'm that. They've been having a bit of verbal diarrhea between the two. Now, 
why who knows i think it's a bit of a shock to carl frotch it's a bit of a shock to a lot of people you know why is aj getting involved uh with uh, carl frotch now they got some previous, and they've also got a history with each other when they were on the uh, when they did some uh, training with each other years ago when uh, AJ was uh, on the Olympic team, of course, and uh, you know they, they were training uh, with each other in the same gym, so they they do know each other. It's not as if they don't know each other. But maybe AJ is taking umbrage to, well, Carl Frotch's honesty and his uh, honest reflections and uh, the way he's criticised AJ in the past. But he criticises everybody. It's critical analysis. It's not personal. It's just critical analysis of anybody. You could analyse critically Carl Frotch's fights from years ago. You know, some of the things that he was doing, how bad he looked at times, but then how great he looked. You know, he, he was losing fights. Then right at the last, he could come back. And, and win a fight you know sometimes he how he would could say leave himself open but also he could deliver a devastating blow as well so anybody could be analyzed and critically analyzed for their performance you've got to be able to take that on the chin you're a professional sportsman so i i'm, I'm with carl frotch on this to say well you know what you know i, I think you're a bit a bit silly coming at me just for for criticizing or giving my opinion on your past performances but when I saw the little the tweets or the WhatsApp messages or whatever it was between the two, I kind of wondered, has somebody got hold of AJ's phone here and started responding on his behalf? I'm not sure if anybody's mentioned this, but it just appeared to me that the way AJ was responding in those messages, it just appeared that, is this actually AJ talking or is it somebody else? It, there just seemed to be something sus about the way he was responding and it was almost like he said i don't talk too much or i don't say too much and it's just like now you, you've said quite a lot so then why aren't you saying anything in you know in this in in these uh this little exchange here i wasn't so sure about that i'm not so sure that uh, aj's done that i think maybe somebody's done it on his behalf I don't know. I mean, it could be AJ. It could be that they've, he generally thinks that Carl Frotch is a bit of a dickhead. He could have taken umbrage of all the things that he said. But you would have thought, well, do you know what? If you've got something to say, you would say something a little bit more. Their paths are going to cross. So what? Are these two going to get into a bit of fisticuffs? No, of course not. But could they, you know, square off against each other and make a bit of a, an idiot of both of themselves? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they could. They, it could be embarrassing for both of them. So, you know, they just, I think they need to just put this aside, put this to bed and just carry on. If you don't like each other, you don't like each other. But AJ, you know, and any sportsman, any boxer, any sportsman has got to be able to take critical analysis, just like the England football players right now. Oh, no, you can't criticise us right now. You know, ex-footballers shouldn't be criticising us right now. No, they can. That's what anybody, you know, if you're commenting on, on any kind of sport or as an observer looking on, then yeah, you are you're giving your opinions, you're you're analysing what you are seeing. You don't have to have played the game, you don't have to have got into the ring, you don't have to have been an ex pro or ex team player or ex champion or ex anything. If you're just analysing what you're seeing, if you're just giving an eyes on view, then hey, listen, that's all you're doing. It's just like anybody can be watching this video and then be completely critical of what I'm doing, what I'm saying, or how I'm saying it. That's the way people want to be, that's fine. Especially if they, they are analysing something in a, an appropriate manner. You know, they're not just talking about nonsense, really. They are actually trying to break down a fight or break down a game and say what is not working, what is working, how things could be improved. That's absolutely fine. So the likes of AJ kind of need to take that on the chin a little bit. Or or do as I do, just block, just don't listen to anybody. So so just don't watch what people are saying about you. You'd be a much healthier person for that. And you probably wouldn't be getting into online spats with anybody at the same time. But anyway, do I think AJ is going to be Dubois? I do. Do I think AJ will beat Fury? I kind of think he does. I can't wait for these matchups. I can't wait for the future of boxing. And let's say in the next year, next six months, next year, I think it's going to be fantastic. I can't wait. Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If you like what I do here, don't forget to like and share the video, subscribe to the channel, hit the notifications bell for future videos, and I will catch you again on another video coming very soon. Bye now.